Friday evening I hopped in for a quick shower and sermon prep was just bugging me. I went to the doctor for a checkup on a Monday uh, for, I hope, really nothing. Um, and then there's a baby coming. Then I was thinking about inflation. <laughs> Maybe I just finally admitted I'm a little stressed. And on top of it all, I literally had 12 pages of notes on Revelation 3, 1 through 13. And so far, what I had for a message was less than spectacular. And I was just praying in the shower, Lord, what do I do? <laughs> Am I just burnt out? Do I pull out some old messages and call that good? Or... And the passage that I think that might come to any Christian in those moments, if they know their Bible, came to me, which says... Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And at first I was like, yeah, that's, that's great, Lord. So what? <laughs> you want me to preach on that? Or I'm just tired of switching texts every time I can't think straight. This has nothing to do with my text, Lord. <laughs> and that's where the Lord got me. It has everything to do with our text. I just didn't see it at first because I don't think any of my commentators or study Bibles saw it. But now, whenever the Lord dropped that passage on me, I couldn't unsee except for what the Lord is offering here and what that has to do with the church of Sardis, which is what we're studying. So I had every intention of preaching on both the letters to Sardis and Philadelphia in Revelation 3 today, but the Lord said, you're trying too hard, you're trying to cover too much. So we're just doing Sardis. I do invite you in honor of standing to hear the word of the Lord. If you're able to stand one last time, we're going to read Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation 3, beginning with verse 1, says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes. And I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let's pray. Father, help us to listen to what the Spirit is saying to us today. We believe and trust these words were written down long ago. Your word testifies to their supernatural origin. We know that John wrote them down, but he wrote them down because your spirit inspired him. Your spirit was directing him. Holy Spirit, we trust you are present also today. The same spirit who breathed these words is in this room and can breathe to our hearts and minds the things you want us to hear. So Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts and minds. Help us not to grieve or resist the Holy Spirit. Instead, to receive and obey. Not because... You want charge of our life with a power trip, but because you made us and you know how we will thrive and you want us to thrive in communion with you. Lord Jesus, you reconciled man to God through your spilled blood. So we pray that you would make the gospel alive to us today. Say the things that you desire. Have your way in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
your work stinks. That's what Jesus is saying. (laughs) Your work stinks, and that's really got to hurt. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. And I wondered, what does this mean? A lot of commentators wonder. Some wonder, they look back to the church in Ephesus where Jesus had a letter for them in Ephesians 2, and Jesus said there, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. And so some wonder, is this Sardis' problem? Others might ask, maybe their works are entirely of a a religious or self-works sort, the kind of thinking that the Galatians had who said, we should be holier so we'll be more acceptable. Instead of the truth that in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. In other words, the law doesn't count for anything when it comes to you and Jesus. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Maybe that's Sardis' problem. And I first heard Matthew 11 come to me all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And then I went back to this text and I said, ouch, ouch, Lord. I wonder if, like me, sometimes you get caught up in all this Christian stuff. The Lord's work and you work and you do and you do and the reality is you actually just end up doing and working the way you want to do and work. Look, Lord, I'm loving this person. Look, Lord, I'm studying today. I'm reading my Bible today. Look, Lord, I put some extra in the offering. Or if you're like me, look, Lord, I did it. I wrote down 13 pages of notes. (laughs) Look, Lord, I did the bulletin again. Look, Lord, I had coffee with Kevin. Your work stinks. Your works, my works. Your work stinks. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother also. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then a young man said to him, I have kept all these. Look at all these works, Lord. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions. Give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Works. I've kept all these. What do I still lack, Lord? You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. You're fooling people, right? They think you're alive. Maybe such people fool themselves, too. This is what church does. This, this is... This is what life with Christ is like. We're doing things. But Christ says, Christ comes at them. Christ confronts them and he says, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. You know, Paul Paul talks about deep down. Underneath all the deception, all the lies, he says, all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness do what? Suppress the truth. Under all that, there is a remnant, a memory, a latency of what work is, the kind of work, I wonder, that Sardis knows they need to do, and that part needs to wake up. It's just suppressed. What's missing? What kind of work are they they doing That just isn't perfect in the sight of my God. And I read this letter like a self-righteous religious person. That's why I was having trouble. Like a Pharisee. That's why I was blind to it. I, I, I had emptied the letter from the gospel. I have read it like Paul warns against in 2 Corinthians 3. He talks about having a mind that is hardened with a veil wherein only in Christ is it set aside. And I started to set aside this veil when I got to verse 4 in our text, which states, Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis 
who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. This, I feel, is the key. This is what undresses, excuse the pun, but undresses the puzzle. It, it, what answers the why and the what to do of the Sardis Christians, how their works are not perfect in the sight of God. Those whose works aren't perfect, they're wearing soiled clothes. You're like, oh, well, I did my laundry, I thought. No, not, not that. Isaiah, the prophet of God, he throws himself in this lot when he writes in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. Or God says elsewhere in the prophet Isaiah, I will concede your righteousness in your works, but they will not help you. What is God saying in those moments? What is Isaiah saying? We don't impress God. The New Testament, of course, agrees, as Paul affirms, to a, a gathering of people really smart in Athens. You know, they're the cultured elites. And, and Paul says, The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. I wonder, I lean more into certainty, that is Sardis trying too hard. They've become Christians and now they're trying to, we're serving God. He needs us to make Sardis great for him. But their clothes are soiled with their attempts at righteousness and it's repugnant to God. He's not served, but he doesn't need anything. I know some of you put some money in the offering, you're like, can I have that back if he doesn't need anything? <laughs> And so the Sardis Christians have the reputation, the name of being alive, but they're really dead. But some do walk with Christ. They're dressed in white, for they are worthy. We heard the story of Joshua, as told by Zechariah, read by Bill, take off his filthy clothes. And to him he said, see, I, says God, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you with festal apparel. Friends, if you try to work yourself, to rid yourselves of your own guilt, good luck. Good luck. That is not why, you, I mean, did you see that? See, I have taken your guilt away. And this truth matters to God. That he's the one who does that. It really matters that he's the one who covers you, that he's the one who saves you. That he is the one and the only one in his works, and his works alone are the only works that you place your faith in. That really matters. To place your faith in your trust in your own works is repugnant to God. In Matthew 22, Jesus takes hold of this wedding garment, this white clothes theme again, in a parable about a king who invites people to a wedding feast. And then the climax comes. And he says, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, notice the urgency, the severity, the sobriety of the situation. Only such persons who have taken the wedding garment that the king provides are worthy. Those are the worthy ones in Sardis, the one with the white robe. Remember then, Christ says to them, remember then what you received and heard, obey it and repent. This isn't news, right? Like nobody in Sardis is probably scratching their heads. They, they know exactly what he's talking about. We just forget it all the time. We're like the Judaizers in, in Galatia. Paul says to them, I am astonished 
that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the what? The grace. The grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. We, we can quickly turn away from what we received and heard. So then you, Christian, woodland friend, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten that it is Christ who works in you? It is Christ who is your righteousness. And even if you're working like a dog, and even if some say, wow, look at that Christian go, boy, aren't they alive and kicking? That if your work does not come from your faith, but from your fear, then you need to remember what you received and heard, obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, says Christ to the Sardis Christians, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. This is a personal for the Sardis Christians. That's who Christ is writing to. We see that in verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write. But did you know that Sardis has a history of sleeping? So King Cyrus of Persia, the same king who allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to build the temple in the Old Testament times, that Cyrus once took and captured Sardis. Sardis thought themselves to be pretty invincible. They had built themselves on a steep hill with three, really, which feel like cliff faces on each side, elevation drops. But the south side saw a narrow entrance. And there was a soldier in Sardis guarding when the story goes that he dropped his helmet. I don't know if he took it off or scratching his head or whatever. Maybe drinking some coffee. I don't know. Anyways. Um, but he dropped his helmet and it fell down one of these steep sides. But he was able to hop, skip, and jump, get down there, grab his is his helmet, climb back up. And one of Cyrus' soldiers observed all this, and they said, ah, well, here's a way to get into the city. That hill doesn't seem too very foreboding. And that's how they invaded the city and took it over. But then a little while later, in what we would call the intertestamental period between uh, the word to Malachi and then John the Baptist, there was another capturing the city when, again, the narrow entrance was guarded, but all three other sides were not guarded, and this allowed Antiochus the Great, a Greek ruler, over to overtake the city. There was negligible watchmen not doing their duty. They're sleepers. And so maybe it's, it's irony that that sort of sleepy lifestyle is embedded in the urgency of the Christians of this town as well. But these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, says Christ. Uh, these symbols come out of Revelation 1, verse 20 of that chapter says, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And as you read the seven letters to the seven churches, he always says, To the angel of that church, the word angel could be a supernatural angel, could be just a pastor, or because the word angelos is actually just means messenger of God. Or it could be the person reading the letters. The seven spirits of God is symbolic, no surprise. But what does seven mean? Complete, perfection. So, you know, sometimes we refer to Jesus as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's also Spirit of Spirits. He's the Spirit, the Supreme Holy Spirit. And so this is a God who has all the churches in his hand. He has all authority. He's the supreme authority. He knows the spirit of every church, including Sardis. That's who's talking to Sardis. That means that's who should wake up if they're sleeping. I mean, I know some of you, we just read our Bibles and go to sleep while we're reading our Bibles. <laughs> but God is the one who's talking to you. This is who speaks to you, Christian, when you open up the word of God. So are you listening? This is who has plans for you, so do you ask him to lead you. This is he who speaks. And the Sardis Christians has a history of sleeping. They're not awake to the word of God, and if they're not awake, they're not listening, not watching Christ. He will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come, will come to you, he says. Now, this sort of imagery shows up in other parts of the Bible that seem to refer only to the second coming of Christ. 
his final coming at the end of the world. But in those places where Christ describes his coming, he says his coming will happen like a thief in the night. Whereas, did you hear the contingency here? He's saying, if you do not wake up, then I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. It seems like there's a condition in this instance. So I'm just saying, I feel like Christ is using the same phrase, but he's talking about a different coming. That's okay. He can do that. We do that too. If I said, hey, if you hear a... um, I just lost my train of thought. (laughs) Never mind. So the Sardis Christians should instead learn the lesson instead of stay asleep. They should learn the lesson. That's the point. Back in verse 5, Christ says, If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, who we talked about. This is something we can repent from. It should be a good thing to repent from. You don't have to impress God. You don't need to do works to impress God, right? You and I, if we're working, working, and working, there is reality in what Christ says when he says, Come to me, all that you are weary and carrying heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. So whenever we hear, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God, it's not that Christ wants us to work harder, but to work purer. It's not that he wants us to put in more hours in the day, but to put more trust in Christ. Because if we trust in Christ, if we depend on Christ, if we rely on Christ, and if we stop saying, have I done enough for you, Christ? But actually, if we flip that and say, you've done a lot for me, Christ. What do you want me to do? Maybe he'll direct us to do something that isn't for the benefit of our salvation, because that's already been secured, but for the benefit of his kingdom. Because we already said Christ is entirely concerned with our motivations. We may not be, but he is, right? How did you get in here with a robe, with a wedding robe? Why are, why are you here trying to break into my wedding feast and ignoring the clothes I gave you to wear in the first place? Those are the clothes you need to wear. So why are you not wearing them? But if you are wearing them, Christ promises, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. Now, some of you, if you're following me and if you're not asleep yet, you will be. No, just kidding. Um, we saved the best for last, this, this, this verse, because it's really got people talking. There are some people who would believe this, that that God decided before the foundations of the earth who's saved and who isn't. And the saved people have their names written down in the book of life. The unsaved ones don't. In fact, this seems to be kind of the point in Revelation 13.8 where he says, And all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it, referring to the worship of the beast, which, you know, spoiler, you shouldn't worship that beast. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. So what does this mean back here in this verse? Why is Christ writing down names in the book of life, but by his very words here, stating that a situation could theoretically exist where one's name might be blotted out, erased? The name was written down. They were saved. They were receiving the benefits of being on the register of the kingdom of heaven. But hey, you need to conquer what I'm talking about here. You need to have the right works before God or I'll blot your name out. I'll remove you from the citizenship. Now, first off, I would say, I think we should all agree that in the kingdom of Christ, where Christ is Lord, Christ can probably do whatever he wants to do. We probably should say, you need my counsel, buddy. (laughs) He can do whatever he wants to do. 
And if he wants to banish a citizen to exile, he has complete authority to do that. I am one, personally, who I believe that a person can forsake one's own salvation and willfully walk away from Christ. The Bible gives us all sort of warnings that I take as real warnings, not theoretical ones. Uh, Paul says, listen, I'm telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify every man who lets himself be circumcised that he's obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So in other words, Paul is saying, if you think you need the law to be saved, he's not talking about that simple medical procedure. No, that was just a symbol to refer to the entire law. And he's saying, if you think that God is so concerned that you take that entire law and you follow it to a a T and that's how you're saved, that very act, you're actually cutting yourselves off from Christ. You're falling away from grace because you're not thinking it's grace that saves you. And so Paul is warning the Galatians, a real warning, an urgent red flag. He's saying, if you think your soiled clothes is what God wants and not his white garment, then you're falling away from grace. That to me sounds like forsaking salvation. Sounds like you were in a place of being saved, but you've done something to wander away. Paul tells his spiritual son Timothy to fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are names I will not (laughs) pronounce for you, whom I have turned over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Shipwreck in the faith. That doesn't sound good. Here's the picture I see that faith is a ship, the destination or the port of salvation. These two have suffered shipwreck, meaning they didn't get to port. And then Paul says he's handed them to Satan. If your leader or ruler is Satan... If he's your master, I'm assuming that means Christ no longer is, and I think that means you've forsaken salvation. The brother of Jesus, James, he finishes his book with this encouragement. He says, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, I think James is talking about a real scenario here, not just one that could always only ever be imagined. In other words, things like this can happen in James's mind. That if a sinner is wandering, but a Christian brings him or her back, that person will be saved from death. What kind of death? A death that might, be happen, that might happen if someone's name is blotted out in the book of life. So Christ is pressing the urgency here to the Sardis Christians. If you conquer, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. And you might be saying, but what about eternal security? What about blessed assurance? You mean, if I don't get this motivation for works figured out, I've somehow committed the unforgivable sin? Well, I think with the attitude of Paul, or to say it like Paul, I would say that if you go to your dying breath denying Christ and his works and instead trying to offer your own as hope for salvation, then I think you've missed the boat entirely on the gospel. You are deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. So I think you and I should not ask if God's grace is sufficient, but we should ask or we should pray, are we yielded? And you and I know this, we can be yielded and humble to some people all we want, but they won't be gracious. But if we're yielded and humble to Christ, he'll always be gracious. He'll always receive us, and there is eternal security in that. It's just, it's just when Christ is gracious and receptive But if we are the ones saying, no, I think I'll skip out on your grace. I think I won't listen. As Stephen said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. So the problem then is resistance. 
When people come by and say, hey, stop doing imperfect works. Come to Christ, rest in Him, do His works, they're perfect. And you and I say, I'm just fine, I'll just keep doing what I'm always doing, that's all I know. That's resistance. Christ wants change. Christ wants you to wear His white clothes. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, says Christ. And the good thing about this change is that it would be something ludicrous to resist. It is ludicrous to resist. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The labor that Christ wants is a labor that is easy and a burden that is light. And churches and Christians far and wide that are weary and burdened and laboring hard with heavy weights, the sad truth is, is that's more work and it's less pleasing than to what Christ wants out of his own people. <clears throat> God wants you to know that your sins are forgiven. Your identity is his son and his daughter. And like we sang, your righteousness is built on nothing less than his blood and righteousness. And from that place, that is where we begin to work. From that identity, that what he did on the cross is what paid the ultimate, final, only necessary price. And any works we are to do come from a place of faith and love. Not fear and striving. Does that make sense? I hope so, because I didn't write anything else down. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I think about what it must have been like to hear that your works are not pleasing in the sight of my God. And as Sardis Christians, they could have said, but everybody else thinks we're good. We have a reputation. Your word tells us in the book of 1 Samuel that people see on the outside, but you see what's in the heart. And if any of us have hearts that feel judged and condemned and we feel like we never do enough, remind us today, as the Son of God, I've done all that you need. I have died for your sins. You're no longer guilty. I've taken away your guilt. All I want you to do is to wear the white robe the white clothes, not the soiled ones. Because, Father, if we truly enter into a relationship with you, with a trust that is grounded on that, that you've done everything, you love us, the price is paid, then you can free us up for works that are pleasing to you. Then you can free us up to do what you want us to do. Not because we're trying harder to impress you, but because we get to be commissioned by our Father to do his work. So we thank you for that, and we, I ask that if anybody has not figured that out or hasn't made that change, that this would be a day of salvation for them, that they would place their faith and trust totally in Christ Jesus and everything that he's done for them. And that, Holy Spirit, you, you would be living and active and speaking into their minds to tell them, here's what I want you to do next, and that they would be obedient. It's just that simple, to be obedient and say yes to everything the Spirit tells us to do. Lord Jesus, as I think about the potluck we're about to enjoy, I ask that you would just bless that food and bless our conversation and fellowship with one another, that our conversation would be pleasing, it would be fun and enjoyable. And we thank you for time that we have together to do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed to downstairs, or if you have to go, I guess we'll let you go. <laughs>